I did. Good. All right, Tori, you ready to go? Yep. Cool. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Lynn Stoddard. I'm the Director of Sustainable CT. Welcome to this webinar on fantastic things towns in Connecticut are doing around arts and culture. We're excited. We have a bunch of stories today we're going to share with you. Um, so I wanted to give you a quick foundation. Um, arts and culture is uh, one of the nine impact categories of sustainable CT um, to create inclusive, thriving, and resilient communities. Um, we have four main arts and culture actions in our roadmap right now. Um, I'm just gonna mention them briefly because uh, the stories you'll hear today connect with all those actions. So um, mapping tourism and cultural assets, supporting arts and creative culture, developing creative placemaking plan, and providing arts and culture programs for youth. Each of these actions have a lot of sub actions underneath them, and we are eager to expand on them. We're actually writing new actions this summer. So you have any ideas inspired by this conversation or others about additional things we should include in the action menu related to arts and culture or anything else, let us know. Um, you can always contact any of us at info at sustainablect.org. So before we introduce our, uh, the folks who are gonna share their stories of what their towns are doing today, um, I wanted to hand it over to our partners from the Office of the Arts for the state of Connecticut. And Tamara Dimitri is going to share a few words about the resources they have for their towns. Great. Thank you very much, Lynn. So um, my name is Tamara Dimitri, and I'm a program specialist with the Connecticut Office of the Arts. And I first want to thank Sustainable Connecticut for recognizing the value of the arts as a community connector and economic engine within our communities of all sizes and for partnering with our office to ensure that the arts are woven into um, the initiatives. So I know we will be working closely with Sustainable Connecticut as we sort of look and uh, reevaluate um, some of the work that they've been doing and ensure that this work um, continues to strengthen and grow. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Connecticut Office of the Arts, we are a state arts agency within the Department of Economic and Community Development. We administer a range of grant programs that support arts organizations, artists, and arts projects across the state, where we utilize a combination of state and federal funding. Our federal funding is awarded through the National Endowment for the Arts. In addition to grant programs, we support the arts ecosystem um, through professional development opportunities. We connect schools with teaching artists. We work closely with our regional partners on initiatives such as arts and economic impact studies, cultural um, district designations, and many other localized and statewide efforts. Artists, creatives, and arts professionals are all among us within our communities, small, medium, and large. And our arts professionals have the skills for problem solving, um, connect, connecting the dots. Um, they are a source of inspiration during times of need. And therefore, you know, we certainly encourage you to ensure that the arts community has a seat at the table. Creative, creative minds play an essential role when planning um, sustainable solutions. And again, it's now more than ever is a time when we really need the arts, um, especially during this um, current pandemic. It's exciting to be here today for this webinar and to hear directly from four fabulous presenters who will share their success stories about how they've integrated the arts into their communities and we look forward to partnering with Sustainable Connecticut on further webinars, which will highlight more of the arts initiatives that are happening across the state. And I also just wanna put in a plug to make sure that you are signing up for our newsletter and to visit our website so you can learn more about our programs and offerings. I'm gonna turn it back over to Lynn and, um, to our presenters who will dive into the deeper fun stories. Awesome, thanks Tamara. So, um, and thanks for the great partnership. 
So yeah, we're going to start off with what's happening in Manchester, Connecticut. We've got Stacy Zakin from Workspace and Chris Silver, the Director of Family, Leisure and Recreation. I'm going to hand it over to you guys and we'll have time for questions at the end. You guys can feel free to put questions in the chat as the presenters are talking. We'll figure it out. Excellent. Thank you. Can you see the um, PowerPoint? Yes, we can. You're good to go. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Slideshow. Play from start. So um, my name is Stacy Zakin. I am the manager of Workspace, which is owned and operated by the town of Manchester, which happens to be my my hometown. We're two and a half stories of co-working and meeting space. It happens to include our main gallery, which is uh, the windows you see there along Main Street, um, as well as two other art spaces. The Loop Gallery on the first floor collect, uh, connecting the main gallery to the downstairs meeting spaces, and then upstairs, which is where our co-workers um, work and all of the walls and the conference rooms up there are filled with art um, as well. So we have media equipped meeting spaces and private offices, co-working desks, and whenever anybody comes to do business, they can't help but escape the fact that the building is infused with art. And we believe that the galleries support the entrepreneurs and business leaders that work there. And in return, that entrepreneurial spirit um, leads to how we work with artists who themselves are uh, entrepreneurs. So what we believe at the galleries is that art is a tool for community building and social change. We believe that sharing ideas and supporting others within a diverse network leads to increased knowledge, expanded perspectives, and inspired action. And we also believe that we have a responsibility um, and we also benefit from reaching a diverse um, audience, both in business and in art. So through everything we do, our gallery exhibits, our entrepreneurial support, um, we like to focus on um, diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as accessibility and relevance, which I know is um, the State of Connecticut Office of the Arts, their READY program um, focuses on those values as well. So we do have core values through the, the galleries to be collaborative and resourceful, to embrace all different types of art, uh, whether it's two-dimensional art that hangs on the wall or performance, um, converse, we do spoken word. Um, we're very adaptable, so even though we love to come up with great ideas, we like to see what the community needs and then adapt to that. We wanna be community driven. We wanna be very transparent about what we're doing so people can uh, see what we're doing, why we're doing it, and help guide the future. And then we're entrepreneurial because we are a co-working space. And we work closely with the development of downtown Manchester which before COVID um, was definitely on a revitalization. And we have a lot of great businesses that we like to align ourselves with. So it's really all about synergy. We did a diversity, equity, and inclusion art show last year. And it was through that process that we realized having a DEI art show is not enough, that every art show, every initiative we do, every program has to have those values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Jasmine Jones' work here is in the center. She was actually featured on the cover of the Hartford Current uh, art section, insight section this past Sunday for her documentation of um, what's been happening during the pandemic and in terms of the race and equity issues that we're all, all dealing with. Arpita on the left, she is um, from near stores, Connecticut, and she's a quadriplegic and um, had to retrain herself to be an artist after an accident where a tree limb fell on her neck. Um, and she's just an amazing person and we're so happy to be able to showcase uh, work like hers. Um, and Casey, excuse me for a second. It doesn't seem like the slides are progressing. We're still seeing slide one. That's not good. And you're talking about some cool people, so we don't want to miss yes. it. Yes. All right. So let's share screen. What are you seeing now? Ah, uh, now we see Arpita. And okay. Norm. So, Thank you. Um, 
So this is what you missed, picture of our building. <laughs> and um, uh, the road race, that's a picture of uh, the Manchester road race happens is uh, in front of our building. Uh, this is our core values and back to Arpita and Jasmine Jones. Um, and Norm Greenstein, who's up on the right uh, corner there, his, um, his work, sorry, my dog is barking uh, very loudly outside. Um, he's known as the Parkinson's painter. So he started painting after he was diagnosed with Parkinson's as a therapeutic tool. And our next art show is a veterans art show and we are gonna be doing some programs on art as um, therapy. In terms of um, having synergies with other organizations in Manchester, the Cruisin Car Show happens every year. So we thought it would be nice if we collaborated with them and did an art um, show, uh, automobile art themed show, which we did last year. We're planning to do again this year, but it uh, obviously got postponed. Imagine Main Street is another uh, community organization that collaborates with us. They host their inside market and it's basically an open house for the street, which I know a lot of people around Connecticut, a lot of towns around Connecticut do. And we're really thrilled that they use us as a, as a site and that we can partner to promote art as a catalyst for social change. Um, one of our members hosted two open mic nights here and it was really nice to see um, people in their 20s, um, a lot of people doing spoken word for the first time, talking about issues relevant to their life, which was so much different than my own upbringing. And it was just great, again, to support those by offering them a reasonably priced venue um, to bring in all these people and bring them together. And um, our upcoming art shows, we will be opening uh, for a veterans art show, then followed by wearable art, which is a great theme because it allows us to um, partner with different businesses on Main Street who sell jewelry or do hair. Um, the Firestone um, is going to be, they paint pottery and do glass, so they're going to be painting some sort of um, aprons or t-shirts or something. So again, if people come to visit us, we want the to contribute to having it be a downtown destination where they visit us, um, but then they can also go to the Firestone, they can go to Harvest Bead, they can go to Urban Lodge, maybe they'll have a special themed drink at the brewery. So a lot of it is about partnerships. Um, I work closely with other people in the town of Manchester, including Chris Silver, who's gonna speak uh, after me, he um, oversees Better Manchester Magazine, which created a virtual art gallery of happy things. People in the community were asked to submit images during the pandemic that actually brought a smile to their face. We saw the great virtual gallery and actually had it printed and turned it into a physical gallery in our front window. We created Creative Spark, which is a six to eight minute video that artists get to do promoting themselves, their work, their creative process. So we now have a virtual playlist on YouTube and we're just about to turn one of our offices into a recording studio. Um, so for an economic rate, uh, people can come and do promotions for their business, can do speaker reels, podcasts, whatever they need and we'll provide them the space and the technical support. And the last thing I want to speak about is the um, Manchester Arts Commission, which is appointed by uh, our local government to um, keep a watch over the state of the arts. They do a Hall of Fame event. They also select a poet laureate and a town troubadour. So it's great that our town invests so much. This is a picture of Ryan Parker. He is in fact the current poet laureate and he's also gonna be the featured speaker at Workspace's um, monthly TED Talk event where we used to come together to watch a TED talk and discuss it. We now ask people to watch the video in advance and then we get on Zoom and discuss it. So again, I think one of the, the best um, things that we do is the synergy between different programs. And there's just such um, a plethora of different arts organizations and groups and businesses. So we all like to uh, promote each other and support that type of work. Uh, little libraries were put up around town where local artists, including myself, fortunately, got to paint um, little libraries with the Women's Organization. It was sponsored by Chris's department. And um, the Manchester Sculpture Project is another volunteer uh, program where we got our, our first sculpture up recently. 
Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Silver, the Director of Family, Leisure, and Recreation, to talk about the programs coming out of that department. And I want to thank him because he was instrumental in turning workspace into workspace, helping us with our branding and uh, mission and vision. All right, Chris. Thanks, Stacy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. And to brag about our awesome community and its creative means to connect and engage people, which is becoming one of the most effective approaches we've ever used. And so Stacy talks a lot about infusing art into what she's doing. Well, um, it, the same thing is uh, true for our department of leisure, family and recreation. We have three divisions. It's the recreation division, the youth service bureau division, and the office of neighborhoods and families division. Now we, we definitely infuse art in all of them. Um, uh, what we do as well as our public spaces and places. Um, and um, uh, our Neighborhoods and Families Office, which is charged with working with what we call our Equity and Inclusion Collaborative, which is our um, appointed group of people that we work with to help move the strategies of our inclusion and equity plan, community plan forward. One of the first things that we wanted to do in partnership with uh, Stacy's building was to um, mark the beginning of this work in this community, the completion of the plan, the development of the collaborative, um, um, and uh, to um, mark that with a uh, public installation of a mural on the back of her building at Purnell Place, which has also been a vision of our city manager to do more public installations in our um, downtown buildings um, behind Main Street at Purnell Place and doing capital improvements there uh, to create um, uh, an additional venue downtown to draw people back um, in, in that building. Uh, so that was the, um, that mural uh, was selected by a committee of people uh, representing equity and inclusion and our movement forward um, regarding uh, race equity in our community. Next. Um, <clears throat> so Spruce Street, Spruce Street Market Nights, another initiative through our Neighborhoods and Families Office, um, was really um, part of a 10-year plan, our Children, Youth, and Family Master Plan, where we used art um, and uh, created resources and facilities and, and means to engage people down into one of our low to moderate level income neighborhoods uh, by bringing um, a market into the place, but also creating, taking a firehouse and transforming it into a um, resource center, which also um, hosts uh, Gallery um, 153, um, which is public space for our local public artists. And those public artists um, in the beginning of this work um, got free uh, public space for their exhibits if they chose to become an illustrator or artist for Better Manchester Magazine. So the first 10 years of the magazine, all our majority of the work that we did there is local artist work, um, but uh, we uh, doubled that up uh, by giving them an exhibit too, um, and you know, helping to promote our local artists um, within the community and bringing art and culture into a neighborhood that didn't have it, but now has it on a regular basis. And um, the addition to the, the market also included, again, monthly gallery exhibits um, of local artists too as part of the overall market, which includes uh, live entertainment as well, local musicians. Um, this 10 years of Better Manchester, this is um, when we created our Children, Youth and Family Master Plan, um, we needed to um, find a way to communicate um, the strategies of this plan to the community um, in terms of progress and where we're at and where we're moving if we're you know, turning the corner on things. So this is what that magazine did and it was part of the um, uh, recommendations of the plan to create a communication vehicle to engage and connect people. Um, and you'll notice in that magazine, it's all illustrated, all those covers are local artists, et cetera. The per Perspectives Art Show again is uh, uh, connected to uh, work with Stacy, the work with the um, Equity and um, Inclusion Collaborative. This show, again, perspectives really focused on um, um, taking the lived experiences of um, people of color or people of different races and backgrounds and communicating that uh, perspective, that lived experience through art. Um, it was an incredibly uh, successful show. And, you know, the interesting thing is one of the coordinators we hired there, Pat Johnson, she was so concerned. She came from Harvard. She said, Chris, you know, 
we just don't feel like we got enough local people here. And the bottom line is the majority of people that participated um, at Workspace, at the gallery, for this show, the artists, the people who came to the workshops that Stacey put on, um, they were, majority of them were for out of town. And for me, that was more successful than our local people because that's exactly what we want. We want people from surrounding communities to see Manchester as a destination for arts and culture. So it was successful and she was very happy about that. Um, again, right out loud, um, these, this, this picture that you see here, and you can see the bottom picture, those are the fire doors, but that's our Eastside Neighborhood Resource Center, which is a, a small firehouse that we converted as one of our first resource centers in the community and the home of the Office of Neighborhoods and Families, which began 10 years ago. Um, it's created vibrant, vibrancy and connection um, down in that community along with the market and the community gardens, but now with Ryan Parker, as Stacy earlier mentioned, who is the leader in the spoken word and write out loud and all this program. And we gave them a home in that resource center. So uh, Friday evenings, they perform there. And I'm gonna to talk to you about another building that we are transforming using art as a catalyst um, to um, expand upon um, these emerging um, practices in art, performing art, et cetera. So the Community Youth Art Initiative um, was twofold. One, we wanted to um, encourage young people to be creative and artistic. Um, we wanted high school um, kids to also have an opportunity uh, through um, writing and um, uh, art um, to um, work collaboratively to develop um, children's books um, for incoming kindergartners to promote early childhood education and school readiness so that all kids can read by grade three. Um, and that is a, a, one of the indicators in terms of graduation. So the idea was that um, neighborhoods and families provided all the resources and support. We worked with the um, a creative writing class and the um, illustration class at Manchester High School. We have been partnering them for the past five years. Um, there is an exhibit called Things. So this particular year was Things in a Park. The students um, illustrated and wrote a book, both Spanish and English, um, using that theme. Um, and all those books, which were published, this is, we've had five of them, um, go to every single incoming kindergartner um, in school with some uh, healthy tips for parents um, and educational pieces to, to help them understand the importance of reading to their child and the importance of reading, preparing their kids um, to be able to read by grade three. So this is what I'm really, I mean, I was excited about all that other stuff, but we've been doing that for a while, but this is, um, this is um, right at the forefront of the excitement. Um, we have a, and I'm sure some of you are experiencing the closing of schools within your community. I'm one of the leaders for repurposing our um, uh, closed down schools. And uh, one of the concepts that we have created for Mahoney Rec Center and uh, Washington School, which uh, is a full rec center attached to an elementary school in the west side of town, which is a stone's throw over Main Street from where Stacy is. Um, and everything I was talking about was on the east side of Maine. Now we're heading to the west side of Maine and starting to move our work over there. Another low to moderate level income neighborhood needing that infusion of art and culture into that neighborhood, um, being able to create spaces where regardless of your background, you can walk in and feel like this space is for me. I feel welcome here. I feel like I belong here. I feel connected here. And we're using art as a catalyst. So we're taking the, if you can go back to that slide, please. If we're taking um, uh, recreation and sort of flipping it upside down. And, and it, in the traditional sense of recreation, it's sports and exercise, but um, uh, there's a whole contingency of people and young people that aren't so much focused on the athletics of things and really creativity and creative outlets are what they're looking for. So Leisure Labs has a three floor focus. We don't want to get rid of that health and exercise and wellness, but that's the bottom floor where we focus on health and wellness. We go up to floor two, Leisure Labs, um, that becomes uh, our creative lab. And creative lab is is sort of building upon what Stacy has down on um, uh, at workspace, creating a collaborative environment, collaborative environment through the arts. So there are there are all these different floors and rooms 
that are connected onto one floor um, that have uh, visual and performing art opportunities. Um, and uh, the idea is that these different types of arts, whether it's music, creative writing, um, painting, dancing, they um, are on the same spot and, and our hopes are that they will cross collaborate and um, develop projects uh, that um, take the different types of art backgrounds and um, sort of blend them into uh, one thing, but also creating a social environment for people uh, with creative backgrounds. Um, and then on the third floor of that building, it's the Culture Lab and a whole new gallery installation. It's called the People's Gallery. So what is produced there and what is generated there will now have public space to be shown and seen. Um, and then, so that's the idea of it. Um, and then you can go to the last slide. Um, so Wreck on the Run. You know, it's important for us when we are looking at our community and and how we distribute our recreational amenities and opportunities and resource centers and you know creative opportunities. Um, Rec on the Run is a solution, even though we are very equitable in terms of where people can access services. Um, Rec on the Run uh, brings recreation into parks, rec uh, you know, through creative arts, sports, and games. Largest focus is on the creative arts. Right now, this summer in COVID. Um, Wreck on the Run goes to one park, same park every day, all uh, Monday through Thursday throughout the entire summer. We have taken pizza boxes and pre-packaged them with art projects um, that we distribute at each park. Normally, our instructors are at the park. We have a whole setup. People sit down. Families participate together. But we didn't want to lose momentum of this phenomenal project, bringing, bringing arts and sports and games to places where we may not have the brick and mortar to do so or the park space or green space to do so given access to um, uh, children and families um, uh, in terms of um, creativity and health and wellness um, it's been hugely successful and that's all i got i think right awesome stacy and chris thank you so much Manchester's doing a ton of really exciting, inspiring work, and we appreciate you sharing the stories. I imagine that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we're going to move on to hear from Adrian Jefferson, who is the Director of Cultural Affairs in New Haven. You've heard a lot of references to equity and inclusion um, in the work Manchester is doing. It's certainly a foundational piece of sustainable CT. And Adrian's doing some deeper work on that in New Haven that looks like it could be a model for all of us. So take it away, Adrian. Thank you. And hello, everybody. I am happy to talk about our cultural equity planning process. Um, I first just want to send some love out to the Connecticut Office of the Arts. Um, I'm glad to be on this call with Tamara. That is my family. Um, prior to being with the city of New Haven, I was with the Connecticut Office of the Arts, so I know them very, very well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to talk about what we're doing in New Haven. Um, I have only been in my role since February, and, and, and the role really was to look at cultural equity and really look at how we can look at the arts landscape and make sure that it's more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. And, and then the pandemic happened. And what's so interesting about the fact that the pandemic happened is that we saw a lot of the inequities that already existed become exacerbated by, by the coronavirus. Um, and now we're also experiencing extreme racial tension and race wars is kind of what I'm calling it, um, which is allowing the role. It's interesting how the role of arts and culture is starting to play a role in these different crises moments. So I will talk about a little bit of our work around that a little later on, but right now I just want to kind of focus on the plan that we had in place for cultural equity in general. So um, prior to me starting this role, this department really needed to be rebranded. You know, our core functions typically were the Mayor Vitality Grant Program, Film Permitting, Percent for Art Program, Public Art Program, and curating major key city events such as like tree lighting and fireworks. Now these programs are um, symbolic events is what I would say in the city. People look forward to them, but they definitely do not cover the full scope and breadth of what arts and culture represents in the city of New Haven. And it often has not been culturally relevant 
or inviting to those from historically marginalized communities. So I was tasked with looking at this um, in my first probably day or so of, of being in this role. And um, the mayor Elliker, who is the new mayor for the city of New Haven, his administration was kind of tasked with looking at the transition report that um, he administered before becoming mayor and really looking at how to prioritize cultural equity. What was interesting is with the city of New Haven, along with many other different things that was identified, arts and culture was one of the top priorities for a focus point and particularly cultural equity. And so my department had been tasked with prioritizing cultural equity and increasing the role of artists to work more closely with policy making and government, looking at how we can create more paid opportunities for creatives, finding more equitable processes for dissemination of arts and culture information, and creating free or subsidized event spaces for artists. Um, the transition report screamed loud and clear what we, what we needed to do because the transition report document was led by the people. And, and I thought that it was very important that we honor what they were asking us to do. So in addition to this, as we're looking at different programming and we're looking at cross-sector development and initiatives, we really need to partner and have decided to partner with economic development, city plan, transportation, public health, housing, food justice, workforce, um, and many other different cross-sector partners to really identify the barriers to access to arts and cultural opportunities. It's important to acknowledge when we're doing cultural equity work that if you really want to look at diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and anti-racism in these practices, you really need to acknowledge the barriers that are in place, not just in the art sector, but in all, all sectors that really create a barrier to participation in the first place. So over the uh, next 12 months, and it, and it looks like we're getting to a place where we can finally pick back up on doing the cultural equity plan, not operating in a mode, mode of crisis all the time. But once we do begin, it'll probably be about a 12 month process. We are going to be looking at the 100 day recommendations from the Mayor Elliker's report. And we're really looking to do a few things. We want to build community. That's, that's a huge part. We wanna use the arts to build community. We wanna have difficult conversations. We wanna break down racial and socioeconomic barriers to arts and cultural resources and participation. And we wanna provide paid opportunities for our local creatives. We also wanna strengthen our partnerships, our cross-sector partnerships. So you'll hear me talking about that a lot today. The plan is going to be completely led through the lens of diversity, equity and inclusion, justice and anti-racism. Because in our work and in our analysis since beginning this work is we see that you really can't have the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation without acknowledging justice and what that looks like and what that means in the role of the arts. Um, so, so we're doing that work and we're also going to have local artists, community activists, New Haven residents come to help us identify these problem areas and develop solutions within our current arts and culture landscape. Our goal is to adopt a shared, a truly shared community vision. And we really wanna look at how we tackle systems of inequity that play, a, again, a key role, a key role into creating barriers to arts participation, to engagement, and to under resources, um, resource communities. So we've already had a lot of departmental buy-in. Uh, we're looking at mobility, you know, lack of mobility, childcare needs, healthy food options, environmental studies, all of this plays a role in what can be a barrier in enjoying the arts or getting to have a job in the arts. And so again, we're going to really look at these systems. Now, as far as like processes, we've been planning this for a while. And so we've been going back and forth with what our process will be. But as far as our key, our key steps, we are looking at, you know, first we have to look at research and discovery. We wanna look at extensive city documentation, doing a field literature review, a wide range of online city and community meetings, which originally prior to COVID-19 was all gonna be in person, but now it's mostly gonna be conducted virtually or outside. Um, so community engagement, a key part of this, cultural asset mapping, collaborations. Um, obviously we're gonna draft up the plan and for us, the plan will need to be adopted by the Board of Alders in order to actually be uh, implemented. 
So everything that's built out of the plan will actually help to reshape our department. So right now, we're actually not really running or operating our, our department as normal because we understand that this plan needs to be priority and that the people really need to have a say in what our programming looks like and, and how our services operate and really just disrupting government on its head. We want to make sure it's a grassroots approach, not a top-down approach. So um, some of our focus areas with the different sectors we're going to look at is race and ethnicity, immigration, sexual orientation, gender, wealth, um, looking at the opportunity gaps. We're going to look at redlining. So our department is, is actually sectioned under economic development. So we get to work hand in hand with, with economic development and looking at gentrification and trying to stop gentrification and also looking at the developments that are coming up within our city and really getting an understanding of why, you know, when private develop, developers come in, you know, how are, they, how are they interacting with the community? What spaces are being created for the community to have a seat at the table? And, and, and we, again, we wanna just stop gentrification. So that's actually a big thing on our list. And, and you'll see as I'm talking that, you know, the arts really plays an essential role and not just necessarily always programming and not necessarily in always being this fun bubbly thing, but also in these very important cross sector issues around diversity, equity and inclusion. And that's our main focus here. Um, as far as our strategy, like I said, originally, we were going to do like a whole bunch of town halls and focus groups and fishbowl conversations. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic and because the pandemic does not seem like it's going to be over anytime soon, most of this will be conducted virtually. Some, as the restrictions lift, some of the stuff may be able to be done outside. But, but again, we're looking at mostly virtual. We are trying to figure out how we can take care of the, the digital divide because we understand that not everyone has access to be able to do this online. So um, just overall, just in closing with this particular project, we want to make sure that we have artists at the table from the beginning and that they're being paid as consultants to be a part of this work. I think that that approach is very unique in itself because typically you see people hiring outside consultants and then you see artists being asked to be at the table but never being paid for their contributions. So for us, we want to make sure that they're right there at the table from the beginning, we have a budget where we will be paying some artists to be at the table as a part of the steering committee, working with our consultants, working with our community, working with our community leaders and other, and other departments, and really shifting the narrative of what, of what consultation looks like. So our approach is people first, and we wanna make sure we're using the voices from the community to tell us the changes that they wanna see from, from our department, you know, and from city government in general and allow the residents of New Haven to kind of control the narrative on what arts and culture is to them and how we can best serve them and how, how we show up as a city. So that's, that's kind of the spiel on what we're doing with, with cultural equity. We are rolling this plan out very soon. We're hoping in the next couple of weeks to get started. Now, as I said earlier, what's interesting about this work is that, you know, we came in when I first started, I was like, okay, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. And then obviously the world had other plans because the pandemic showed up. And then we obviously see everything that's also happened over the last three weeks. And so everything has been crisis mode. And so for us, we have been looking at how do we show up right now in this moment using cultural equity. So, so what we've been able to do is number one, play a really, really key role and the economic resiliency efforts and the recovery efforts by partnering with economic development and really acting as a key team member with them and able to mitigate the damage that's happened to New Haven. We've been looking at community well-being and mental health, and we've developed a number of different programs around that, working directly with our constituency on the Together New Haven program, on the Mask Up campaign, where we partnered with community influencers from all over the city of New Haven. And um, the influencers, most of them artists, and most of them artists of color, were using their voices to tell people to stay safe and mask up. 
It actually was a very, very effective campaign on billboards all over the city and on buses all over the city. And that happened through our leadership as a Department of Cultural Affairs. Right now, um, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the fact that the Columbus statue came down in the city of New Haven. Um, and we're, we're, a key, we're a key partner in that conversation of what goes, what goes up and how do we look at public art through an anti-racism lens. And when we look at trying to curate Black Lives Matter street writing and murals all throughout the city of New Haven, how do we do this by unifying and engaging community and conversation before we just throw things down or put things up? And so we're really looking at place and what that means when we're looking at, you know, place making and all of that. What does that mean from a, from a perspective of always putting the community in their voice first? We also are doing a lot of, um, a lot of work around anti-racism and undoing racism. We're actually working directly with the mayor and directly with economic development on leading these conversations with the community and also within departments and looking at our policies and how we change our policies and our practices. So um, I think that's about it. We have one other thing that we're working on is the, the, uh, the COVID-19 memorial. So we obviously in light of everything going on, um, we've been listening to people and they've been saying, you know, we, we want a memorial that's gonna represent this time and, re and also honor those who, those who have passed from COVID-19, but also maybe a memorial for social justice. Um, maybe a memorial that just commemorates everything that's going on right now as an unprecedented time. And also as we look at the disproportionate numbers that have affected COVID-19, you know, with black and brown people being impacted disproportionately, how do we honor, how do we honor those people and how do we bring light to that truth? So we have a group of Yale presidential students who have been working with us. Um, the city is their, we are their clients, and they have been doing all of the outreach, all of the mock-ups to show us what a COVID-19 memorial could possibly be, both virtually and um, physically. So yeah, we're very excited. We have a lot, a lot going on. Thanks so much, Adrian. <laughs> really inspiring stuff. Um, and clearly, so connected to kind of the voice and the pulse of what's going on in the community. So um, great example for all of us. So um, there is a question in the chat about um, the relationship to sustainable CT. And I'll just address it very briefly and we can get into deeper uh, during Q&A if we have time. Um, so, the committees we're highlighting are a range of um, participants in Sustainable CT. Manchester, who you heard from first, is a bronze certified community. As you know, they had to do at least one thing in the arts category um, to achieve certification. New Haven is a silver certified community. Um, Torrington, who we're going to hear from next, is a registered community. Um, New Britain um, are not able to be with us. Um, they are our newest, bronze, uh, newest certified community at the bronze level. And um, the actions, as I went over first, we have four main actions within the arts category. Many of the things we heard about in Manchester would probably fall under action 3.2. So ways to support arts and culture in a community. We have a list of those kinds of things embedded in the actions, such as Poet Laureate and Arts Commission, um, which were mentioned in, um, in the Manchester work. Um, the cultural equity planning could be like a really fascinating way to show the equity action 9.1 um, connected to arts and culture. Um, if, if any, of, any of you on the phone have been working on your um, certification submissions, you know that equity, equity is the only required action in the program and you need to kind of take a lens of looking at who's in your community and um, including their voices in decision making and access to services as you reflect on another municipal decision, um, which could be something in the arts. So we can get into that deeper and I'm happy to take questions um, offline as well, Christine, um, to guide you through some of that um, a little bit more. But I wanna leave time for Marty Connor from Torrington, the planner, 
and he's gonna um marty i'll turn it over to you and you can cue torin when you're ready for some of the audio visual visual support sure hi i'm uh, marty connor i'm the city planner for torrington and uh, i was asked to speak to you a little bit about our artist relocation program that we have that uh, uh, has gotten some recognition from the state and actually from around the country. Uh, we were actually recognized by AARP in a, a publication that they put out, which was called Where We Live, Communities for All Ages, 100 plus uh, inspiring ideas from America's community leaders. And uh, we were honored to be the uh, representative for the state of Connecticut. And it was based on what we've done to try and promote arts in uh, Torrington. We're really trying to rebuild our downtown by using the uh, arts and entertainment uh, to bring people downtown, to revitalize our downtown, we have some great institutions already. We have the Warner Theater. We have a world-class ballet company, the Nutmeg Ballet. Uh, we have a great historical society, uh, that the Torrington Historical Society downtown. We have uh, quite a few arts organizations. We have uh, one in particular that really works with uh, our inner city kids CAFTA organization. Uh, we have uh, several uh, larger uh, organizations as well. Uh, probably the most exciting one, uh, which we just unveiled yesterday, uh, our Five Points Center for the Visual Arts. They purchased the Yukon Torrington campus, which had been closed down for four years and uh it's a thirty thousand square foot building on 90 acres of land and this is so exciting because this is going to transform the property into a very unique sustainable multi-level visual arts center with an adjacent arts park and we really think it's going to strengthen the social fabric and economic growth of the region. Five Points already has a gallery in our downtown uh, and they have workspace above it, which uh, is called the Artist's Launch Pad. And the Artist's Launch Pad works currently with three different universities in providing workspace for young artists that have graduated from art school and are looking for their first studio experience and they're able to rent space for $55 a month. And then they work collaboratively. And it's a really, really great opportunity to bring uh, young artists to the city. Uh, we, with that AARP recognition we got, they actually came out and did a little video. I'd like to uh, have you see this little video that they did about Torrington and then talk a little bit about what we did to change our regulations and what spearheaded that to try and encourage more artists to live and work in Torrington and offer our opportunities uh, that can be inclusive. So could, could you please run that little video? sure our downtown is very walkable and we want to encourage mixed retail and more restaurants and as a result of uh, the great focus that we have now on the arts we have seen some new restaurants open up and i'm very proud of that location is perfect sounds like it's a little difficult to hear we'll see if um we can make some adjustments but um yeah. Well, 
Well, maybe what we're doing is just uh, using it as, uh, I don't know, a uh, PowerPoint sort of presentation. Uh, that's Judith McAlone, who's the executive director for Five Points Gallery that was speaking about what we're doing to bring young people downtown. Previously, you saw an older gentleman who's a very famous- uh, I've seen huge changes in the downtown uh, since the gallery opened, and though the gallery isn't totally responsible for that, uh, we have been a catalyst, I think, for downtown Torrington. Uh, we have a mayor, uh, Mayor Carbone, who is very, very supportive of the arts and planning in general. Uh, we've had a very good response from our planning and zoning commission. Um, they they have a vision for our uh, revitalizing downtown that includes uh, the arts uh, in particular. This is probably one of the few, if not the only, cities in the country where an artist can come in here and find a property, commercial or residential, that suits their needs anywhere on the city map. And with uh, the concurrence of planning and zoning, they can set up a studio here for a fraction of the cost that they're now paying in major cities. We have uh, consortium agreements with three universities and have just started this year a launch pad for artists who are graduates of the Hartford Art School and they have shared studio space above the gallery uh, for $65 a month. It gives them a community, uh, it gives them 24-7 access to studios and those artists come from all over the state. Just learning about what artists need, what their needs are, uh, has been helpful to me to figure out what I can do as a planner to make it easier for artists to work and live in Torrington. I just think this is a heck of a community for an artist to work on. And when I say artists, I'm not talking about painters and sculptors. It's uh, dancers, musicians, potters, weavers, poets, anybody that fits under the broad category of art. This is going to become the cultural center of Connecticut. No, I have no doubt about it. It's just a question of time. Young people can, can work and buy a house and fix it up. Artists can come and find a manageable economy. Uh, you've got the Warner Theater, you've got the Nutmeg Ballet, you've got the arts community, you've got the downtown restaurants. I think we have to keep building on uh, making uh, our community a destination place uh, for people uh, other than residents of Torrington to come visit the arts, appreciate the arts, uh, enjoy our restaurants, enjoy our recreation activities. Uh, we're trying to meld um, the walkability, um, pedestrian, bicycle access, um, connectivity with our downtown. Uh, it's all very exciting and uh, I'm proud to be the planner for the city of Torrington. Thanks, I'm, I'm glad we finally got that working so that you could get a little uh, taste of what we're trying to do downtown. Uh, the older gentleman, Ed Jaffe, that uh, spoke, he's 92 years old now. Uh, when he was 89 is when he re really started bugging uh, me and the city to make things easier for artists to work and live uh, in Torrington. And uh, he, he had a very convincing argument, and he's worked all over the country. so. It was really great to learn a lot about uh, artists and what they needed and how we can bring them here. And uh, I think we've been pretty successful. We've reeled in a few very prominent artists, but more exciting is the young people that are involved in the arts. I think one of the participants on uh, this uh, webinar today is a, a woman named Steph Burr, she and uh, and her uh, assistant Maddie uh, are young people that are extremely involved with what's going on in the city, and they got the vibrancy. They're bringing other young people in, and um, I'm excited to be able to work with them as well. Uh, and uh, Steph is the head of the Northwestern. Uh, uh, Arts Association and uh, works with artists from all over the Northwest area of Connecticut. So um, we're excited about the arts. 
Uh, the only thing I, I say today is uh, this COVID-19 situation. I worry about our large arts organization, uh, uh, especially our Warner Theater, who really can't even plan any events probably until the spring of, uh, of next year. So we need to figure out a way that we can keep our arts institutions going, uh, keep our artists working uh, because they really are important to the state's economy and the quality of life in Connecticut. So that's basically all I wanted to talk about, uh, how uh, excited we are about the arts in Torrington. Marty, thank you so much. Another really inspiring story. So we are running late. What I'm gonna suggest, sorry to cut out the Q&A too much. If the presenters would just post their emails in the chat so people can get in touch with them directly with questions. Um, Mark Moriarty from New Britain um, had an emergency but just graciously jumped on. So we're gonna give him a few minutes to talk about the Bee Bridge. Hey, Mark. Let's see, Torin, can you unmute? Unmute, okay. Here we go, you're set. Okay, um, let's see, so can, I need to share screen, so what do I need to do for that? Um, click on the little bottom, green, should have a green button. Okay, screen. all right, good. Share screen too. Okay. Cool. Um, we see it. You see the the first sheet of the Beehive Bridge. The um, gotcha. yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So Beehive Bridge. Um, I'm just gonna really jump through it. It's hard to talk about this project really quickly, but I'm going to um, just kind of give you a sense of what we did and how it all came about. And I'm really gonna focus on just a little bit more um, the art and. Uh, the placemaking components of it. So this project we completed last September. We had a big groundbreaking celebration for it. And let's see. Um, just a couple of good images. It's 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 pretty amazing project. It's definitely I always I always I don't haven't been saying it as much recently, but um, my career is all downhill after this project. It was by far the best project I will be. I will work on it was um, such a meaningful project um, and like you go you go to this and this is what we were faced with um, for the Beehive Bridge this is the overpass as it existed prior to us taking on the Beehive Bridge project um, one of the ugly and it's and it actually is Main Street in Britain so this overpass which um, prior to Route 72 is a you know a lot of stores, a well, um, strong section of our downtown, some good old architecture, and it became this ugly overpass with extremely narrow sidewalks, loud exposure to uh, the highway, long expanse, and it really did divide the city in two. When we got into our Complete Streets Master Plan, um, this was actually looked at as the most important project that we, we were going to take on with um, our complete streets work. It was uh, ended up being our phase, phase five project. Um, but a little bit on this graphic, you could see on the top part of the screen, that's our little Poland Broad Street area and then City Hall and the other main part of downtown where the museum is, the Walnut Hill Park, Central Park are to the south of 72. So this and this overpass, it really actually couldn't occur at a worse location. It was one of the wider sections that divided uh, the city. So um, one of the first things that we set out to do with our complete streets work was to basically re rejoin, like, you know, I guess like more prominently, like in a pedestrian friendly way, rejoin the two sides of downtown. It's just a graphic, kind of looked at the area that we studied with our complete streets. This is a breakdown of some of our projects. This is the phase five project where the Beehive Bridge was. Um, kind of just breeze through some of this stuff in interest of time. 
these are some of the projects we've been taking on. Um, it's about $25 million. So it's a, these, these projects, the Beehive Bridge itself was a $7.5 million project. Um, and this is what I, when he took, I'll talk about this more from a complete street standpoint. Um, and because our complete streets work, it's everything. It's like so all encompassing. It's like making, it's, making uh, making places so that's dealing with um not just the the aesthetic aspects with the functional aspects pedestrian friendliness bikes will connect every honestly the same stuff that um martin connor was talking about in torrington it's also interconnected that it's hard to really talk to just one of these things without talking to all of them and it all relates to livability economic development potential um and so this is where I wanted to focus on. With the when it came to the Beehive Bridge, we obviously knew we were gonna we had to make it wider sidewalks, more attractive, um, to to make this a special spot and to actually relink the down the downtown through from a pedestrian standpoint. But we knew we had to do something bigger here because this is a this is the biggest problem. And to really relink both sides of the downtown, it was gonna take um, like a signature projects, like and that had to incorporate. Like we wanted to incorporate um, architecture and art, and but that had to be historically inspired from the city, and it ended up being from the city's seal, which the B B and Beehive plays a prominent role in um, be a project. You know, it's funny, I, I can't believe our complete streets works. It's only a couple of years from actually being done downtown, but um, this was the big one. Like we're doing some really significant projects still, but um, this project was by far the most one. It, it did a lot, like I talked about the road improvements and everything, but um, the big thing it did is like utilize historically inspired art and architecture to help transform the space into like one of the most unique and visible landmarks. Actually, I, I mean, I believe in the state of Connecticut, it's, there's nothing quite like it. Um, drove over the Q Bridge like last week, and I was like, God, I, I, could they have hired an architect for the Q Bridge? I just feel like they kind of missed the mark on, they just have the regular concrete parapet walls on the edge of the Q Bridge and spend a half billion dollars. And it's, it's nice, and I know it has nice LED lighting, but. I just wish that more emphasis in the state was placed when we're doing transportation bridge work on like the architecture component of it. Um, I think we really missed the mark on it. You go out and think, my daughter lives in Boulder and I'm driving between Denver and Boulder and every bridge has, has significant architecture component to it. Um, but that's what we tried to do with this one, we're like really utilize um, art and architecture. This is a, one of the early pictures of the bridge. It actually is before we painted this bottom girder because we actually have this refinish at this point. Um, it's funny, I'll go to this next. Yeah, that's, I, this is, uh, these are some things that we did want to do when we were looking at this project. Um, wanted to be clean, classy, and timeless. That's one of the things that we talked about early on before we got into the design. Um, yeah, like I always, I like this this line: an antique home is contemporary furniture. But those are things that we really were talking about early on in the design process of the Beehive Bridge. Um, yeah, it was important uh, the use of light with the bridge, um, sunlight, um, actual like lighting, like LED. It was important for it to like look different at different times of the day. Um, so it was just like we were we had high aspirations with this project and um, a lot of meaningful goals. My favorite things about this project was the amount of people it took to make this thing happen. There were so many components of it and there's so many champions. I mean, Mayor Aaron Stewart has been well talked about and publicized about this project and how important it's been to her. The DOTA played a huge part in this project. Um, they own the bridge and Honestly, it's like when we were first talking about this project, it was hard to believe that they were gonna um, be so on board because it's like such it's it's so different than anything else that was done in a transportation um, project, and it was uh, 
That means that we get no's up on some really simple things that like we putting a bike lane on a state highway. So actually doing this on a bridge was like, how, how are we going to make this happen? But Tom Mazie, our chief of um, bureau chief of um, policy planning was on board right from the get go. He was a very big fan of the project early on. Austin O'Neill and Ted DeSantos, so I do a lot of work with and we become kind of joined at the hip, I think still to this day. Um, such a leader in complete streets and just like kind of out of the box thinking and um, Martin Larrero and actually what who I don't have out here that's just like a shame on me is that um, so the Gals Associates this is early this is slides from an earlier presentation I did but they were the art, art and architecture firm from New Haven and um, just extremely talented. Um, Marissa Mead is was their lead architect, and she's an artist also, and she just did an amazing job on her um, design. And Laura Peary, actually, who's another artist and architect from New Haven, did a lot of work on this early. Um, Pete Rapocho, he, he's the owner of Sign Pro. Um, he actually built the, the architecture components of it, and the, with the name of the company being Sign Pro, like we had no idea Pete had this capabilities, but um, he's, a, he's, a, it's an, he's an amazing company. Just slide, it's a, it a very early planning meeting when we didn't really have a design yet. We were just getting together and looking and trying to get together with the community and figure out what we wanted the bridge to look like and get ideas. Um, this is a later meeting at Sign Pro while we were actually building the bridge. And uh, I think we're all at this point just like blown away that we were gonna probably pull this project off um, that's Tom Mazier I talked about a little bit earlier. He's the, um, he's a, a huge champion of this project and uh, a, a great guy actually too. Um, not gonna get too much into this. One thing when you get into a project like this, I, I think was fascinating. So if you look at this graphic, this was what the project looked like even when we got past um we had a working group a working group and we actually had the working group decide on two different concepts we had for the bridge and this is the one that actually came out of the working group that decided on the design that got pushed forward but if you look at this like you see these bees they're just like really they're not sculptural at that point in time they were just um like extensions of the pedestrian enclosure and the hive was massive and the structure had a cantilever and extended to the ground. Um, so what happened is that this project cost so much money, we, we ended up into value engineering. I think we're, it's funny, the project throughout the design kept increasing in cost and we kept um, eliminating things and changing things. But what I think is fascinating about this project is that I think as we took away and made it simpler, I mean, not always simpler, but um, somehow we were able to, like, I think the project got better. We had to eliminate the landscape median. This is just a brick strip as it got built. But I think what we built, even though we saved, did a lot of value engineering, thing, we built something bigger. So I don't think when you do value engineering project, you necessarily have to um, take away from its overall impact. But it was it, it did change significantly over the course of design it's a little breakdown on some of the project costs um but actually here we go one great thing that happened during the course of design is we still were having a tough time getting dot to remove the traffic the, the traffic signs that were on the bridge we thought most of the way through the project we we're gonna have to reinstall these ugly traffic signs um we were successful by the end of the project to have them Moved to the bridge, DOT was doing a signing project that they're able to um, take some off. And some of them just honestly didn't really, they just, we mutually agreed they didn't need to be there. This concept, it still shows um, that early, the early B, which is nothing close to the, um, the sculptural bees that got built. It still has a treatment going to the ground and the larger hive. And then again, this is what ended up getting built. I think the end product is really good. It's one of those few situations where I think actually rendering so often can look so much better than what actually gets built in many cases. And this one, I think what we built looks better than any of the renderings for it. 
just a couple of images of um, during the fabrication process. We spent a lot of time going over Design Pro. Um, they actually had to assemble the entire bridge in their in, in pieces in their office or, or in their fabrication room. And so we go over there often and look at things and look at some of the design decisions that were getting implemented. Uh, we did make some, a number of field adjustments. This is this is a section of the bridge that was built. Um, we made a lot of changes over the course of the, but it was fun to see it. It was incredible actually going over there to regularly see it get built. Um, every single triangle for the um, pedestrian enclosure is different in size and had to be, um, hold on one sec, sorry about that. Um, had to be measured and cut individually. It was just a, incredibly complicated. I think there's over 2,200 of them. Um, this is like right early on as we were first last, just honestly, just a year, almost exactly a year ago, starting to see the pedestrian enclosure getting stalled. Remember the first day I saw that going up, I was like, wow, this is really happening. Um, and this is one, they were doing that at nighttime work. We we're spending a fair amount of time out there taking a look at it. It was a, it was incredible. Actually, it was a great experience. That's Pete Rapocio and uh, like his company, I mean, they're, they kill it. He's, he's, he's building a hell of a company, but he was so in love this project and he was out there front and center every single night, like um, acting as a foreman, uh, just overseeing the project. And uh, Mark, we should probably wrap it up because we've okay. been for a bit. These are great pictures. Maybe you can just. Okay. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, the only thing I wanted to go through and show is just a couple of the pictures of the celebration because it was, if you go back to that first space that I showed you that you would never want to be like sit, you would never sit on, you'd never have any of that, you'd never even think of it in that. In the transformation of this project, we created this like great gathering space in the center of their downtown that was like a section of Main Street anyone would be proud of. So. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. Congratulations! It's an amazing project. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was an incredible thing to be part of. Um, I'm not sure if we could pull it off again, actually, but I'm glad we did pull it off the first time. So, well done. All right, I know we've gone a little bit over, but these have been awesome projects and. Um, you can contact the any of the presenters. They put their emails in the chat. We'll be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar as well. So I think out of respect for all of you and hanging with us till the end, we'll probably close it out and um, go on to, yeah, just contact us directly. So thank you so much. Thank you all the presenters. Lots of cool stuff that can be done with arts in our community. So hope you all got inspired today. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.